Praise the Lord. We're going to take to the reading of the word of the Lord. I'd like to read for your intro here. We'll read a little bit more scripture. But first uh, Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. Praise the Lord. For now we see through a glass darkly. But then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Seeing through a glass dark. Uh, knowing the value of our testimony that has been given to us by the Lord. We must walk according to its revelation to us. We were able to catch an understanding of how great grace and mercy has become in our lives. Amen. And what the Lord has brought us from Praise and God. what he has walked us through. Thank you, Jesus. It's not a, a burden. Our past is not the burden. It's, it's not our bad reputation to, to mark us. No, it's to uh, show us where God has brought us right. from. God. Nor is it to place us on a pedestal that we can show it off. No, God has brought me a mighty long way to show me. Nobody else. Right. Now it will testify to others, sure. but it's to show me that he's in control. Oh, it's in the coming of the age when we really see our walk with God for its true value. For the work of God, which is our ministry that God has called. To all of us are called into the gospel of Jesus Christ, called to be a minister for his cause, his kingdom. And we are called to show how that salvation works in our daily walk, in our testimony, and then we're to believe it. I've got to believe in him. I've got to believe in what he's done for me. So on the outside, everyone will see clearly who it is that is Lord of my life. But we must also know and understand. And until we get to that point, I want to see clearly. Yes. When I see clearly, Lord, I pray that you would move upon our hearts and our minds. That your fresh anointing that I feel in this service today would minister to us. That we would be open hearts to hear. Have an expectation of your word to minister in our lives. And to work it in our lives, Lord, I pray we would follow after you as you lead us, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. And everybody said, Amen. 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 God bless you. You may be seated for a few moments here. I promise I won't try to take too much time. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> if you would just allow me to finish reading my text, I'd like to give to you... Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, I'd like to go back for your hearing in verse 9 through 13. As Paul began to speak to the Corinthian church, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away Childish things. For now I see through a glass darkly. But then face to face, now I know in part. But then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abide faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. I'd like to turn our attention back over uh, to Job chapter 2. Praise the Lord. Job chapter 2. Verses 12 through 13. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, excuse me. Verses 11 through 13. Now when Job's three friends heard of all the evil that was come upon him, they came every one from his own place. Ephesus, the Termonite, uh, the Thermonite, and Abilidad, the Shilonite, and so far the Namanite. For they had made an appointment together to come to mourn with him and to comfort him. And when they lifted up their eyes afar off, they knew him not. They lifted up their voice and wept, and they rent every one his mantle and sprinkled dust upon their heads toward heaven. So they sat down with him upon the ground 
seven days and seven nights, and none spake a word unto him, for they saw that his grief was very great. From afar off, they lifted their eyes, and they couldn't recognize their own friend. They did not know him. What is our goal and our purpose? You see, the frustrating part about preaching the gospel is that not many want to hear it anymore, it seems. We may think that it's in my delivery, your delivery. Maybe it's in my pitch. Maybe it's just my style, and they're just not interested, or they don't like me, or they, they don't care for the way I bring it across. No, that's not what it is. What it is, is that it's the message of Jesus Christ. And in itself, it brings a, a roughing of the edge, because it begins to look at their hearts, it begins to give them a value of where they stand, and they don't stand close to the cause of Christ, they feel inadequate. Right. Have you ever felt inadequate when you come into the presence of the Lord? Well, think of that, some of somebody that knows not Jesus, and they come and they feel his prayer, and they feel inadequate. We've got to be able to give them a, a surrounding, right. A, right. an atmosphere that says, oh no, that's a welcoming, that's, that's a, yeah. a yeah. ministry to your spirit. Right. Right. He's speaking to you, he's, yes. he's talking to you. Yes. You see, the gospel, when it is given or shared, by those that are in sin, it begins to convict. It, it condemns. It shows clearly that there is evil intent inside of the heart. When I've done bad, I don't want someone to say, you've done bad, because I've already known I've done bad. That's what God does. Hey, you've done bad, but, but I want you to know there's a place of repentance. There's a, a place that you can come to me, and I'll, I'll forgive you of your sins. I will love you. Right. Amen. Right. It's a constant reminder that the selfish lifestyle that they live is totally sinful and away from God. We need to understand that the value of where God has brought me from, where God has brought you from, makes a mark against Satan's testimony and claim of a soul. It comes against him, it speaks against him because... He had come and he had died, desired to sift you as we. Right. But because no matter what I have done, I put my faith in Jesus. Yes. And because I've decided to do that, he's, he's given to me a place that I can pour my heart out to him. And he says, I know, I want you to know that you can trust me. You can lean your promise. You can put your faith in me. And with that, I have a testimony that will speak into the lives that are around us, around me. And it causes them to see my life that once when I was a wretched sinner and without Jesus, but now I am with him. There's a difference. There's a stark change. Yes. In Job chapter 2, we see where Job's friends come and they come to sit in the morning to comfort him. Everything, as far as they could tell, was just the same. Job's one of the wisest men that I've ever known. He's the best friend I've ever had. And that sound like somebody that knows, you know, if you know somebody of a hierarchy, somebody that's been good to you, that's your best friend. But when they're in, in the middle of trouble or their reputation has gotten a little bleak, oh, wait, wait, well, you know, he's an acquaintance. That's, that's exactly what Job's friends looked at. Right. Oh, we, we're going to come, and, and, and we heard that there's been some trial and error in Job's life. That there's been some problems he's faced, but he's got the finances, he's got the, the lifestyle, he can overcome those situations, and he, 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 he can do it. Right. But then from afar off, as they're walking up the path, the drive, they begin to notice that, hey, that there's somebody different that's in that house, that's sitting on that porch. There's, there's somebody, wait a minute, that is somebody different. Job's in the back. He, what, wait a minute, Job, what happened? I don't even recognize you anymore. You're not in the same place that you was. You're not even saying the same things. You don't even look the same way. There has been a change in your life. And they began, in fact, they were so taken aback that it takes them seven days and seven nights to muster up some words to say anything. Right. 
And so as they begin to look and they begin to grieve with him, they begin to realize that what they knew of their friend was far greater, far deeper than what they was willing to help him with. I know I'm paraphrasing, but that's exactly the way they felt. You don't want to know why? Because you can't do that without being, uh, without God having something against you. You did something so dirty. There, you, you can't even get re uh, forgiveness of that. that. That's so ugly. What Losing an entire family? What did you do, Job? And for the next several chapters of the book of Job, we find where his friends begin to tear him down, ridicule him, judge him for the cause of why, why he was sitting in the position that he was sitting. Well, what you do against God? Well, why would he come at you like that? And then didn't take into account that something somewhere uh, in the eons of heaven, God looked upon his servant Job and said, hey, I know what he can handle. I'll never put on more than he can bear. I know that he'll bring him bear. I know he'll walk. I know there's going to be some hard times. I know he's going to fail. But let me tell you, adversary of the soul, you'll never take him away from us. Now, Joe, 
comes to God and he begins to tell him about it. And then God, for the next 40 verses, begins to ask Job, who made the Leviathan? Mm -hmm. Who made the serpents? Mm -hmm. Job, did you even make those mountains over there? Who called the sky into existence? Who created the heavens and the earth? He began to name the things that he created, the things that he put in existence and, and where it was. Who was the very one that said and left the hedge down and said, okay, adversary, but I've always been there with you. I've always given you. And something pricked the heart of Job and he began to realize the changing in his own life. He began to understand exactly what was happening. You see, they couldn't see it in the distance, the changing. It was showing of the change because Job didn't need the land. Job didn't need the houses. Job didn't need the finances. Job didn't need the cattle. He didn't need all that. All he needed was a revelation of the power and the might of the great God of the universe and know that he was created in his likeness, in his image, and he was in control of everything. And once he come to the rest, uh, realization of that he didn't have any control, that God was in control of everything, he began to repent for his heart. Hey, I didn't do this. Uh -huh. Then he becomes a testimony for the power right. and the might of God. Yes. And guess what? The very last chapter, halfway down, God begins to restore the time. Right. Yes, he what did. he began. Right. Yes, he did. Jesus. Better. He put upon him years to enjoy the plenty and the blessing that God wanted to give him. Could I tell you, God is going to give you a, a plenty of time uh, to enjoy the presence of God. If this is what you desire so much, uh, then he's going to allow you to walk in his realm. He's going to allow you to walk in his goodness. He's going to allow you to walk in his blessing. You see, when the trial of our life has changed us. Uh -huh. The change will be noticed. And we'll be able to look back if we've trusted into Jesus. Put our trust and our faith in him. And you'll see where he has brought you from. Where he has taken you through. Yes. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus began to give the story of the prodigal son. And as he began to make his way to another land because he wanted to live riotously. He wanted to spend at what was his. It was all his self-will. But it wasn't until he was slopping with the hogs, until he was with the defilement of the mud of the pigs, that he wasn't even supposed to be surrounded by it, that he began to realize that, wait a minute, that the servant in my father's house has got it much better than what I've got it right now. They can make their way out of bed and begin to stir and, and not have to worry about the mud between their toes. They can make their way along the hallways of my father's house and they can sing his praises. They have the mercy and the grace of him watching over them, just being a servant. But something's changed in my life. Something's different in my life. I don't want that anymore. I don't want my selfish desires anymore. You see, my selfishness has got me addicted. My selfishness has got me where I'm about ready to kill myself. My selfishness has got me where I think I'm all by myself. I'm alone. Because I just remember the sermon in the Lord's house. My father's house. Did you find my way? Uh, 
Isaac was sitting in the field, and, and Abraham had sent his servants on to find the bride, uh, and, and he didn't want him getting captivated by the things of Canaan land. Now, so we go back home to, to where, where, uh, uh, where family's from and, and get somebody that's a pure descent and, and bring them. And, and we don't realize what back Rebecca had to give up. But somewhere in that young woman's mind, she had plenty of opportunity. She, she had plenty of opportunity to say, Dad, I want to go here. I want to do this. I, but no, there was something holding her back uh, that said, hey, if I go to the well one more time, uh, I know something's about to change. Uh, I think I'll hold off a little bit, and I'll just follow after the Lord. Uh, and so the servant come uh, and began to tell about Isaac. Uh, and she fell in love without even seeing him. Uh, it was a spiritual motion that was happening inside. Uh, and the Bible would say as the caravan would make their way around, there was Isaac praying in the fields. Uh, and before he even turned around to look, uh, Rebecca seen him uh, uh -huh. in the field from afar uh, and recognized, hey, that's my change. That's my opportunity. Uh -huh. And she got up off of the camel uh -huh. and began to make her way to putting the veil across her face, uh, realizing that that is uh, the man I've been looking for. That is the one. Could I tell you that's what Jesus is doing? When you come to this house and he begins to heal up your heart and you begin to suck with him uh -huh. and then you begin to realize, hey, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. That's what I'm desiring. Yeah. I want to be a part of the bride of Christ. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for the hope that I have uh, living for a living God. Give God some praise right now. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, as David finally made the uh, transition, understanding how the Ark of the Covenant actually was supposed to be used properly. He had already sacrificed one priest. Sometimes we've got to look into ourselves and realize that we're not in control. Right. That's right. Right. That's right. right. That's right. And once he realizes that God's in control of everything, he, he finds out, hey, there's a law about this. Uh -huh. There's a way to worship before the Lord. Uh -huh. There's a way to praise him. In fact, they were to dance before the Ark of the Covenant. You know, just at a moment when the, the priest decided to blow the horns. Listen to what David does. He says, I don't want you going over six paces. Because I'm praising the Lord right. every six steps. Yes, yes, yes. And they make a step, six steps. And they would get out there, blow them horns. I'm wishing God. Why? Yes. Because I'm bringing them home with yes. me. I am in the presence of my God. Yes. I'm glorifying Him yes. because of who He is. Yes. Yes. And from her window, uh -huh. a ways away, as David was making a fool before the Lord, Michael, his wife, began to despise him. Right. There are going to be those that are going to mock you, That's judge right. you, tear That's you right. down. That's right. But don't worry about the mockers. That's right. Don't worry That's about right. the scoffers. Oh, yes. Because you're in the presence of God oh, that knows exactly how to bless you right. and to love you and oh, to bless yes. you. You know what David said when, when she got his attention? Why in the world are you making? You're supposed to be a king. Why don't you get your king with robes on and act like you're supposed to act? And he said, no, nah, son. No, nah, ma'am. You, you just go on back to your corner. Right. I'm done with you. Uh -huh. Right. <coughs> the next time you read about Michael, she's being given to somebody else. Uh -huh. He was done. He didn't need that mocking. Sometimes you got to give the mockers all over. Right. Just let him go. Let him and, and so as he said, I'm going to continue to play before my God. Yes. Mm. Yes. Yes. From a ways off, she had already despised him. But from a ways off, God said, I'm enjoying what I'm seeing. Right. Oh, I don't know about you. Maybe you're a ways off today. Maybe there's something that's happening in your life that you need God to make a, set, a, a decision for you, uh, make an opportunity for you. I want you to make way to him because he wants to bless you. He wants to bless you. Come on, give God praise. Hallelujah. When the big changes begin to happen, it begins 
before you really see it coming. Job did not know what God had in store for him. And if he knew, would he want to be a part of it? God has something in store for you. But I want you to know that he's going to carry you through. Because his spirit cares for you. Some things may stop you in your tracks. And there'll be a time of uh, not being able to understand or discern what that time will come. And when that time comes and when he makes himself available to you, believe in him. Right. Allow him to stand up. Yes. Know that he's true. Yes. Because you've recognized the vision of your miracle. Now I am a new creature in Christ Jesus. Yes. And because of that, there comes a change. So the things that I once done, I no longer do. I've done. I've already partook in those. I've already seen where that's going to lead me. Now God has opened a new vista for me. And I see the perfect God. I see where God wants me to go. And now that I know it, that it's just not in part, I'm going to lay down those childish things. And I'm going to grow myself into an adult. And I'm going to walk before a king. And I'm going to worship him no matter what comes my way. Paul said we can only prophesy in part because we've only seen parts that God wants us to see. But when that perfect is come, what is that? That perfect is the, the will of the way of God. It's God shining the vision of your walk with him, making your way perfect. The perfect will of God in your life. The other side of your testimony. It's when God steps in and changes everything. That those that were surrounding you, you're no longer just a friend. You're no longer just the man of the east. You're no longer, but there's something that's changed in you. Something's happened. And you can take the, the ridicule, the scoffing, and, and the murmuring, and complaining, and, and, and my questioning your, your abilities, and because I'm going to put it under the blood. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank what we have known is not what defines us. Glory. Hallelujah, Jesus. But he brings us into his perfect plan and way. Praise God. I wonder if we could just close our eyes in this house. Allow the Spirit of the Lord to minister to our hearts and our minds. I pray that this word has been something that you can hold to and bring it to your heart. Because there's a God that loves, a God that cares. And the only way that we're going to make it through this world is if we hold on to Him. Because everything's changing. But our God never changes. He's always the same. And you'll never change. I, I don't know, maybe you need healing in your body. Would you want to make your way up here and allow me to anoint you with oil and pray the prayer of faith? Maybe you're away from God and you need to get closer to Him. Why don't you make your way up here so we can pray for you? Maybe you just want to be closer to God. Maybe you want that Holy Ghost feeling that you felt when you first received it. Come on up here. Allow the Lord to minister to you, to touch you, to bless you. Anybody just want a refreshing in the Holy Ghost? Make your way to this altar. Make your way to the front. Kneel before him.